Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Jens Heitland Show, where I interview experts from different fields to connect the dots of innovation and entrepreneurship. Today's episode is another Innovation Breakfast Club episode, where I meet with previous guests to dig deeper into a specific topic. Today's topic is the innovation space. Please welcome back to the show, Joshua, Dennis, and Werner. Hello, guys. Welcome back to another Innovation Breakfast Club. How are you doing? Great. Good to see everybody again. Breakfast, the best time of day. Oh, yes. think about interesting things. <laughs> I don't have a coffee. I have only water today. <laughs> you guys have been very healthy then no no caffeine so such as at such an early time in the morning yeah. you know, some of I've us have to much. run marathons oh. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into the topic so topic of today is the innovation space whatever the heck does that mean um i just give us a couple of triggers is it a physical space question mark um is it a head space is it an empty space, a space in between? Oh, what what is it? Let let's start with trying to understand what it is first, and then we we go into discussing it and throwing on top of each other. Let's 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 go with the short rapid fire round in the beginning. I mean, rapid fire two minutes round. Um, Joshua, your thoughts when you hear the innovation space. Oh, I love, uh, love kicking off the discussion and it's a big uh, big question and a big uh, space that you've created for us, Jens, and it's lovely to see you again, uh, Dennis and Banner, um, inside of this Innovation Breakfast Club and always look forward to these discussions. So maybe this is where, where I started my thinking around this. So I sort of started in two places. Uh, the first was in the physical environment and the second was in the digital environment. And the reason I started in those two places was because I think when you think about innovation and, you know, creativity and some different experimental thinking in the past, wind the clock back 18 months, let's say, and you would have done that in a boardroom. Uh, you would have done that with posted notes on a board and you would have done some brainstorming sessions. Fast forward 18 months and a lot of people are doing the innovation thinking and creative thinking in a digital environment using tools like Figma and digital whiteboards like Mural or Miro. Um, and some of that type of thinking. So that's where I sort of started my thinking for this conversation today. The second area that I went into was I went to Google Trends and I uh, put in the topic innovation. And the reason I did that, and I can see for those who are, are not watching the call, is that the guys are smiling because uh, I, I tend to gravitate towards numbers or data or figures in, in these conversations. And the reason I went towards the trends is because I wanted to see had the trend of innovation, so the people who are searching innovation, had it increased or decreased over time? And something that actually quite interesting came out. And so I'll reference this data point, and it's a worldwide data point. So it might be different for your specific location, but innovation trends and topics from a Google perspective have, have actually decreased since 2004. And with that, and having now teed up a wider, made the discussion even wider than Jens just introduced it to, I'll hand it over to Banner and ask him to share his thoughts. So my, my thought is going to be very short, right? So, and this is, a, this is a challenging one. Once again, great to be back. Um, I'm going to argue that it's a mental space. It's a space between here, which is the known, and here, where is the unknown. And in between is where creativity happens, and that is innovation. And I, I have to also say that I, I stole that from Ed Catmull, who is the former CEO and I think currently CEO of uh, Disney. That's one of the things that he spoke about when he thinks about creativity. And you kind of sparked my idea or my thinking, uh, Joshua, when you mentioned the word creativity. And I do think that that is the innovation space because, as you mentioned, it can happen in physical, digital, happen in your office buildings. And we've seen it now even even in a pandemic where people didn't let a pandemic or um, lockdown slow them down to innovate. I've seen products come out in this time that, that kind of took on the challenge. So that is my, my short answer to that. Dennis? Unmute myself. <clears throat> so, uh, guys, it's great to uh, see you in the sunny morning here, uh, at least in Holland. Uh, perspective of the world of uh, innovators and innovation breakfasts. Um, 
if you ask me what is an innovation space, um, all of the things that have been said are true. Uh, and I've, I've uh, heard one thing, I didn't hear one thing, which is I think the, and the maybe for me at least the most important one. Um, it, is a, uh, it is a space in time. And it is the space that uh, we uh, do not have and which we need to pry open in order to be able to um, innovate. Oh, we lost uh, Werner. It was such a, uh, such a profound <laughs> remark that he fell over and he lost his feet. <laughs> no, he's coming back. Oh, here, here he comes. <laughs> but it's only for the ones on video who will, who will notice that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they at least know how to write his uh, last name. Sorry, sorry about that. I, uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. A glitch. <laughs> so, but I, I'm thinking that um, uh, from my point of view, what I've learned over the years uh, when I'm dealing with innovation is the, uh, uh, I like that uh, uh, known and uh, uh, unknown and known thing. Well, maybe you said known and unknown and as a, the unknown, moving into the unknown space. And uh, willingly moving into a space where you don't know um, uh, what you're going to see, what you're going to create, uh, is something that within larger structures, larger organizations, it's just difficult to do. And this is why it's so interesting that you need to fight or claim that space. Uh, and in this sense, I, I really like this book. It's called Make Space. Make <laughs> space. Make space. It's by David Kelly. Uh, of uh, or it's not by David Kelly, it's by David, forward David Kelly, it was by Scott uh, Dorley and Scott Withoff, uh, and there are people who work at uh, at the D School, Stanford D School, and it's a book mainly uh, written to show how to literally make a space for collaboration uh, in order to be able to innovate in a creative way, and this is I would say it would be apply for everybody I think, but it's mainly geared towards people who do. Um, um, uh, I would say innovation design or creativity um, focused um, uh, jobs, but I would argue that make space or the book like this should uh, or have, has to work for everybody and not only for creative people, because whenever we uh, create comfort for change or would want to uh, renew ourselves, uh, we need to move into a space where uh, things look and act and are different. And this is, um, this is that thing that you need to make claim time for and this was why i said it, it's time and you need to literally take it open and you know and then you get to jens's uh, uh, idea about an empty space or a headspace initially it's a headspace but i think if you want to speed things up uh, up you need to make it a physical space and then physically occupy it to say to everybody look in that space we are innovating so that's love my... love that good start I'm just adding my two cents to that as well. Yes, please. <laughs> um, but for me, it's 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 it's. I agree with the unknown and the time perspective definitely, or almost all all topics you you, you raise. For me, the the key point in in my understanding is it's a space between people. So it's the it's, if you take a culture as approach like we have had in, in one of the earlier episodes around the innovation breakfast club, um, the the culture is something you you feel, but you can't really define, or it's it's not that easy to define. I'm just back from from a client to 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 look into how do you define our innovation culture? What is our innovation culture? And I ask them what is the magic of your company, and that's for me is kind of. An innovation space is this magic. So how do you how do you create this magic? So I think, or I truly believe, you can design this magic, and it can be a physical space or a digital space, or a space that's just in the head. Um, but for me, it's all about people. So the people need to be willing to step into that space from a headspace perspective, from a room perspective, and that's that's for me the interesting playground to play on. So, yeah, so, so, so Banner, you go, sorry. No, no, I just wanted to make a comment. So like, there's like, I, I just hear like two things. It's like uh, two tasks. Like the one is to create the space. Uh, and then also then you have to encourage people to step into that space. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. 
So it's just fascinating sort of, it, again, all of the topics and I always enjoy these discussions because there's certain threads that start developing and sort of in researching and preparing for, for today's chat, um, one of the concepts that I came back to and found myself drawing on a bit from, from a thinking perspective is something called a memory palace. And I don't know if anyone on the call knows, knows what the concept and the practice of a memory palace is. Yeah, I think it's, it's when you want to remember something, you, you visualize the ways of thinking. It's like if you, if you, if I remember right, it's like if you prepare a presentation, then you, you walk through your home and you pick different points in your home. And that's how you remember the, the presentation. Is that some, yeah. somehow the right direction? Yeah, 100% spot on. And so I think, you know, to take that a step further and to some, draw in some of the things that we've chatted about so far is, you know, we've, we've spoken about the unknown and the known. We've spoken about creating. And how do you then go about creating that space? And to illustrate sort of what a memory palace is, I'm just going to read a quick quote quickly where it's from Josh Four. So he says, when information goes in one ear and out the other, it's often because it doesn't have anything to stick to. Love and that. then if you think about That's actually really cool. Like I was like, first of all, guy, yeah, I've heard this before. And then I, I got nothing don't, to don't stick Don't tell that my wife, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> because she's saying that it was like, there's it's like your brain is only programmed on work. It's going in there and going out there. So there's nothing to stick. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so, it's sort of the, yeah, so it's, it's almost then, so Jens, that comes back to, you know, what is it sticking to? And I think, Dennis, you articulated well around making space, but then you, Jens, you brought in the people element inside of that. And so it's one thing inside of a business or in an institution to create an innovation space, but what does that actually mean? And I think I really loved what you said around the space between people. It's because the people really can unlock that magic and unlock that innovation thinking outside of that. And I think where that comes into and why I brought up the memory palace in this point in time was because it's about how do you create actionable things from the space that you surround yourself with. And like you mentioned, Jens, in terms of describing the memory palace, it's about the common practice is to walk through a known place. So you go through your house, for example, and then, you know, when you arrive at the door, what do you see at the door? And they say when you go about creating a memory palace is you must make the things that you're trying to remember super extreme because there's something inside of our brains that actually gravitates towards remembering extreme things. And I think that's quite an interesting thread to pull on when you think about creating an innovation space and how we're wanting to enhance that creativity to go and create something a little different. So this is, this is I would say, I didn't expect that this would be going into this direction. And I think that's really interesting. I haven't thought about this in a while, but I used to have a bit of a grudge um, towards innovation spaces, physical ones, because they were created um, just for um, um, nice creativity spaces and not for um, people to be creative in. No, you had companies that just threw uh, uh, 50,000 euros. I think you can probably atone to that one or from being from Deloitte, places like Deloitte. It's just, oh, let's just create an innovation space. And you, you create a really nice, big, beautiful space. And now everybody has to be creative in that space, and which, is, which, is a, which is a huge, huge mistake. Because I would say a lot of companies, they have literally millions of maybe even billions uh, of uh, any kind of currency has been lost about creating spaces where people have no clue what they have to do there. And a beanbag doesn't mean you will become creative. A whiteboard uh, with pens and post-its there doesn't mean you know how to innovate. You know, it is going to help people who know. That that's why I like a book like this, which helps you to create those spaces yourself uh, for a very low cost, by the way, which is uh, something. And it doesn't mean you don't need to impress your clients with a silky, beautiful, a glossy, high-end innovation space because that's not what it's about. It's about getting into that space and really, really. Uh, solving a problem that hurts and it's going to help a lot of people beyond that. Werner. So Jens, I don't like, you don't want to go, right? So I can go. Uh, Cause I, I thought you want to say something too. So th the thing is, I think this is like, I agree with, I agree with it. And um, so I'm talking a little bit as a soldier from the front. So the thing is, I agree with Dennis, what he said about the spaces, but I also think it's like a, a triangle of like 
it's good to have a good space. So that's great. So I'm not dissing Deloitte at all. I love that space. But I think what I face all the time as a challenge, because I spend more time on, fight, on combating this, is that when you, so I agree, like we create this space and then we need to invite people into the space. But there's a there's an element that I, I struggle to describe, but it's, I think in our group, we, we, we kind of assume it, it's a given, but with a lot of folks that I work with, it's not a given, is that people are stepping into the space with their past paradigms in, intact. So you are in the space, you are looking at through all the, your, your normal rules of the day, and, and it's very difficult for people to let go of those para paradigms for, a, for a, like a little bit to say, okay, what if? And I think that is, that is kind of the third layer of like, you know, like, how do you let people let them go? Or how do you get them to let go so that they can get into that mindset of, okay, great. So now we're going to explore the what if. Love that. Super important. And I, I also agree with you, Dennis, um, on the physical thing. It's like a physical space in itself doesn't help you. It might spark a little bit if you are already on the edge of going towards something which is innovative and designing and so on. But I agree, it's it's like you said, Vanna, it's the magic that you 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 have a lot of knowledge, you have a lot of perception of different things, but you keep that into a memory. Um, it's like more into the back end of your brain to say, hey, let's let's not limit us by the knowledge and the experience we have and yeah. and try to do something different that's why but for me this again people part is you you need to you need to do this as an individual but then as well you need to do this as a group if you want to be successful yeah you don't want to do innovation like going on a holiday in south africa with the roof rack and children toys tied to the back and a big ass caravan all kinds of stuff you you're taking your whole house on a holiday What's crazy? Like when you step in the, into the innovation space, let go of all that other junk and then like, you know, open yourself up. Yeah. But that, that is, that is, I mean, I'm saying that like I'm preaching and maybe I'm a little bit, but as, as people who facilitate these things and create these spaces, I, I think it's a very important thing to focus on because we can't just expect for participants and people stepping in that space to just normally just do that. So this is also, I think very, much where uh, um, people like to have, uh, I would say guides or I would say structures that give them a head start in a space like this, which yeah. kind of um, takes away the many years of uh, uh, designers learning how to design or people who haven't done a design uh, uh, education, but they just have been working in innovation their whole life. Uh, you know, experience uh, takes you a long way and it's kind of a, a sad thing that somebody uh, would come in and solve your whole problem just by hanging a, a little process on the wall and saying, let's do this. And then everything is uh, okay. Uh, and this is something uh, I've, I see a lot. I'm also uh, part of uh, something uh, like that with the uh, Event Design Collective, of course. Um, and it, it's a, it's, I would say it's a, it's a, guide, a guided canvas, a Bismol canvas, same thing. They're just starting points. But people tend to forget that um, they are crowbars to opening up a conversation. Yeah. And this is where everything starts. And then being able to move through that space is where you absolutely positively need experts to guide you through it. You need, you need innovation to... Sherpas. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah. It's a much better name than a facilitator. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I agree. But just digging digging deeper into the physical story um what what i love and i think that's also what if if we go back to disney this this transition moment and they have this arc before you enter disney world i don't I don't remember what is written on it's like something literally now you're leaving the ordinary world and you yeah. go into the extraordinary world yeah. which is a transition moment i think that's that's something interesting to explore is if it's a physical space, that that might be a transition moment where you enter the door and you you leave things outside. But how does that look like from a headspace, from a team headspace, from a group culture space? It will be interesting. So let's let's explore a little bit the transition. 
I think it's it's fascinating where you just took that the the point there, Jens, because it reminded me of something that we we chatted about last time. You know, not this specific group, but in a collective from an innovation breakfast standpoint, where Vanna, you raised the point around the communities we select. And I think yeah. when you start thinking about these transitions and spaces that we're creating, and it goes back to something that I mentioned around the interaction between the physical and the digital environment. And if you think about this transition, this moment, this interaction, this behavior, or this emotion that you're wanting to drive by creating that transition, you think about how can you do that and enable that in a digital environment. So if you take Discord, for example, and Discord now, a lot of people may be familiar with it, you might not be familiar with it, but at, a, at its core root, it's really about enabling that community to come together to solve problems and to also influence and learn from one another. And I think that that's something where doing that inside of a fixed physical environment is potentially harder than inside of a digital environment. Having said that, though, I think the transition in terms of that experience or going to onto a Discord server or going into Disneyland is something that maybe the digital innovation space hasn't quite got right yet. But I think that with the likes of VR and some AR uh, capabilities, I think that that might start to unlock some of those physical elements. I agree. I think that there's still, and we see this now as well, due to the pandemic. And I mean, I'm just back from a, my first business trip since one and a half years. It's so different. I mean, I spent two days with 20 plus people thinking about innovation. And of course it was with individuals, but it's so different in a physical environment than it is digital. Though that we have all these amazing tools and we got used to these tools in a digital world, it's still different when you, yeah. when you have the magic in the room where you, where you see the whole body language of the person. And, and I think I agree with you, Joshua, where virtual reality might help us to get closer to that. Maybe you don't feel it's still as good, but I think that's, that's where technology is not there yet for getting to that level. So I, I think I think based off uh, the last time I, I mentioned a company called Spatial.io, who is who is venturing into the space and they're doing really well at it, because uh, the main idea about body language is that you can read somebody's reaction, um, and the, the thing that uh, the only things that need to be, uh, increase is resolution, because I would say that the way that you're um, recording something from yourself needs to be transported to somebody else to be able to read your reaction. And um, I, I, li I like this thought that it could be like that, but I also tend to totally discard it. And, um, and I am um, a, a child from, the, from a very analog generation where um, uh, prototyping things means getting your hands dirty uh, and not making a, 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 a virtual model uh, that uh, works in a virtual space. It's really feeling and touching, <clears throat> doing the things um, that um, um, uh, I would say uses all senses. Um, and I think um, digital will come. It, it will get to get, get to that point. But right now, I think the important thing is that right, people are not um, used to um, or comfortable with change. So it's a strange space to be in when you invite people or encourage people to go into a space where uh, all rules are don't apply anymore and you can think about something else and you can do other things and uh, suddenly that space becomes a uh, either something people dread because they don't like a space like that or people yeah. love uh, there's not a lot of people who are in between that space because uh, I, either you love it which is the people who love to work in these spaces or people tend to don't like it because it's too creative or it's too far away from the structures and responsibilities of your organization. And yeah. um, I, I think in that sense, the, um, uh, your ability to be able to um, uh, move from your regular way of working to a space where you can change, you know, and when you have the ability and you have the mandate to be able to do so uh, because it's healthy. Because it's, it's not that uh, we've been taught that uh, it's good to be uh, to change every year. No, it's really bad. You need to work within this thing, and then you you do your work for thirty five years, and then you can change. It's like no, you know, you can change every minute if you want. It just it depends on how you look at uh, at the world. 
Um, but you know, if we are in the same space uh, with the same people doing the same innovation tasks, it would be interesting to then look at the ways that we create rules um, to, be, to, to be able to move out and then uh, implement uh, innovation like that. That's something that, you know, I, I've been, I did an industrial design study. I think you said did the same, Reiner. Uh, did you do industrial design or kind of? I'm a, I'm a fine artist. Fine artist. I'm, I'm more of an industrial guy, <laughs> creating products and uh, stuff like that, moving into services. But um, innovation didn't, that was just adaptation. It used to be adaptation. But there's a difference. And I would like to uh, draw upon maybe everybody's uh, imagination to uh, think about what it meant for Leonardo da Vinci to get a charge by the Medici uh, to just explore the world because they they love what he's doing. It's an interesting thing about what that means. It's interesting that you say because like you just triggered me because what you said ad adaptation in fine art because I was a sculptor that's what I studied it was about experimentation. Mm -hmm. So I mean it's always like trying to push push in, into our studio space and say, okay, what can we experiment with and what can we discover? Of course, there's a base kind of story that you want to try and tell. There's this deep thing that you want to share with your audience, but you want to do that in a, in a way that represents you. So you're experimenting to find those answers. I would yeah. love to hear with other guys, like in, in your kind of education, like, what, you know, what, what, what is this referenced as? I'm electrician. I'm not sure if that works. <laughs> <laughs> at least from a base education perspective, but maybe it does. I have no idea. <laughs> I've, I've never thought about that. Um, maybe it is from a way of perspective that if you take electricity in itself, you, 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 you can feel it. <laughs> you can definitely feel it. Yeah. But you can't <laughs> see it. And I think that's if, if we at least go into the headspace perspective and to that part, you can't see it as well. Um, so it's it, it's very hard. I, I would love to, uh, after Joshua, I would love to explore a li little bit how we can utilize the empty space for innovation. But let's go with Joshua first. So I've got a little a little thread here that I think that we can draw into the, the to the empty space, Jens, and it's it's around ecological knowledge, and it's something that again links back to the memory palace and some research and thinking that I was doing over the weekend actually, and it's. It was in a conversation with Lynn Kelly, and she was talking about how through ecological knowledge, the memory palaces of today, what we think of a memory palace, were actually physical spaces. And she uses examples from ecological knowledge. So one of, and I'll, I'll share the podcast from a recommendation, but I'm not going to dive too deep into that. And the reason I brought that up is because it talks about this interaction again between your virtual so your your imaginary space that Dennis referred to and how that is enacted inside of a physical environment and how actually through those constructs and and creations on a physical space you're actually transferring your memory into that environment and I think that that's sort of quite interesting Jens when you start thinking about empty space is about how are we utilizing that space and what are the constructs that you create when you create a space and how are those then interacted with and pulled apart or built off when you start thinking about innovation? Thanks. That's triggering, that's triggering me. Is that okay? I hope. <laughs> <laughs> no, because and I, I like the, um, uh, the idea of being able to bring something in to that space and making it very making you very conscious that you bring that in to that space. Because I would say um, from the beginning when the order said you have, you know something and you don't know something and stuff happens in between, um, you can't take everything with you. Because if you do, there's no focus to that space. But if you say, let's say if we can connect to some form of ecolog ecological knowledge um, to solve this and this problem, then I would say you've set the stage. And this opens up the way to encourage people to come into that, that space. And that's, that's an, I think, a very interesting way to be able to use, use uh, research as well and make research available in a way that you prepare and prime a space um, in such a way that people um, uh, help, are helped to 
to solve a problem in a way um, that, that that helps yeah, uh, uh, solve that problem. But I'm already thinking in my head, oh, this is interesting because if you do um, specifically say ecological, I would say one of the things that um, uh, uh, innovation spaces tend to say is that it shouldn't, it, maybe it should be something totally different because uh, you need to shed from all of the uh, structures that you uh, that you are looking at uh, in the regular world and in this new world everything is weightless and everything is this and everything is that and then it sparks that other way of thinking so I'm uh, there's a balance that needs to become there what do you take in and uh, but doesn't over uh, over complicate the initial start of the uh, of the uh, of the thinking in that space don't clutter the space don't clutter the space it's a really important start it can, it can get cluttered when you get there but don't initially clutter it up all the way yeah so i think dennis just to just to jump in on, on something that you that you said there it's, it's quite fascinating to think about how, how do you go about doing that and i think that links back to jens's point about people and where my mind goes when you think about bringing different people into an innovation space is goes back to inception so for those of you who've seen the movie Inception and you've got a guide that walks you through the different levels of dreaming. And I think inside of the space is, yes, we need to not be, what's the right word, maybe fully conscious of ecological knowledge. And maybe the reason I brought that in was because I was saying around these spaces were created and the different thinking that is necessarily brought into those spaces and interpreted is largely dependent on the people that are inside of that physical space. And you can do that by bringing in different generations, different cultural backgrounds, different um, uh, genders, for example, and people who, are, who can speak different languages. And I think when you start to think about how you can then manipulate that space and sort of it almost becomes like a melting pot where you can create a melting pot of magic, a melting pot of innovation. And then it's around how do you actually unblock and make something tangible outside of that? Because I think something that, you know, I think we can all articulate and maybe maybe advise on is also sometimes innovation is just this big buzzword that's thrown around in different spaces and by people because they want to seem like they're doing something but it's how do you actually make innovation tangible what is the actual real outcome of this innovation space that you're going and that you're creating and how is that going to then add value to either yourself as an individual or your business yeah i agree, agree. innovation for the sake of innovation is it's not helpful at all. So it's it's really how do you enable this through a space and through innovation to trigger something to happen, which can be, hey, my business needs to be reinvented. I have no idea how to do that. How do we do that? Or whatever it is. So it's really understanding that. I was just thinking, I don't know why, but I got triggered by 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 some of your words. Um Again, with with this melting pot, what you said, I mean, that's how, how funnily enough, uh, I got to know Werner and Dennis. We have been meeting in an extraordinary space, which was a castle in Poland, um, which is the College of Extraordinary Experience for everyone who is, who is interested in that link will be in the show notes. Um, and that was... I mean, it, through the space, space, through the melting pot of putting extraordinary people who have never heard of, about themselves or the others, um, they have done something magic and repeated something magic. And that's how we got to know each other, I don't know, five years ago or six years ago. So that's, that's also an interesting perspective. It was an empty space with... with a lot of thoughts behind it from an organization perspective, but for the participants who joined that castle experience, it was kind of empty. Nobody was knowing what to expect. I mean, everyone had expectations, but nobody really was knowing what's going to happen. Then nobody was knowing whom to meet and all these kind of things. So that's it was fascinating. Vanna. Yeah, you know, I just want to add to that, and, uh, and not necessarily we have to like do a coe a coe -E -E, deep dive here. But I think um, you know, subsequently I was lucky enough to work on two of the of the events afterwards, and 
something that was kind of intentional and it kind of relates directly to something I think Jens, you said, is that during the design of the event, something that is also really important is that there's a focus on stripping people from insignia, um, titles, um, backgrounds. Uh, I mean, because arguably when I met Jens for the first time, it was just Jens. Dennis was a guy wearing the Pope's hat, you know, um, and I got to know them as the humans they are, not as their job titles. And we, I think sometimes even for us personally, we, we try and hone in onto, oh, that's the guy from Google. That doesn't matter. Hmm. You want to talk to the interesting guy. And I think sometimes we make that mistake uh, and we, we gravitate to the wrong people. And what was really interesting with the college is that it really managed to strip that kind of that layer away as well. And then of course you also place people in a kind of strange environment where they all, they both, they all go on this journey together, right? That's the experience that you, that's created for all of them. Yeah. And I 100% agree. I've had a discussion around this topic today, coming back to Germany. Holy moly. I just, where, where this status of, Hey, I'm the boss and I have a power and, in, or I have a position in a structure is more important than the human itself. I just have had a couple of discussions on that topic today, which just fascinated me. And I think it's so important if you think about innovation that, that you take that off, where it's not yeah. about, hey, what title do you have on your business card? It's more about, hey, how do we solve a problem? How do we use the space where we meet physically, digitally, or headspace in a way that we solve a problem and everyone is chipping in. Everyone is contributing with their knowledge, with their experience, with their crazy thinking to find out how to do that rather than, hey, this is the big dog in the room and we need to do what he, he or she is saying. Dennis. So I guess I guess that's the that's the um, the reason why we say, or you guys say, or at least say, I've been repeated to saying, that in the innovation space is a people space. Because um, uh, we tend to get stuck in our job descriptions and our positions when we uh, rightfully so are in an organization where these roles are important because you get, you're accountable for them. Uh, but it's difficult to work together on something when you are the CEO and you're a junior and uh, you're standing next to each other. And it's like, how, we do, how do we look to, towards this problem? And you start to react from your own uh, perspective. And I think an innovation space, if you're trying to define it in the right way, initially needs to, to strip you from all um, uh, responsibility that you have in your in the in the daily day to day business, and uh, bring you into a space and let you use your natural human ability to think and solve a problem. And this can bring a junior and a senior a current leader, a future leader together to be able to work together to solve a problem from different perspectives. And that's, and that's, that in that sense, we say magical, but the magic comes from the fact that you know how to, or, and not a lot of people know it. That's why it's a magical thing, but uh, Disney knows it. You know, and I would say everybody who is uh, an, into experience design knows it. You know, how to, you need to know how to prime your space in order to have people go through an experience. And innovation is also just an experience. And you need to design that space in order to make people be able to move through it in a successful way. And uh, in that sense, um, uh, uh, I'm starting to understand that this space, um, you know, it's a very important space that I don't get why, don't, why companies don't put more focus on having spaces like this that change constantly and inspire people to look and be comfortable with change and think about ideas. And when you pass the threshold into this space, which I guess when you go to uh, the Rotary Club or to uh, the Freemasons Club or anybody, you pass the threshold and you are equal. That's the whole point. You pass the threshold and you're equal. It makes you uh, able to share experiences uh, in an equal way. And then when you leave, you put on your coat with your roll again and your hat and then uh, you take what you take away and then there is a responsibility of the person who takes all this melted stuff and goodness and pour pours it into something that restructures your company 
which is an, a very interesting thing about when you leave that space. Yeah, the, the tricky thing, at least in my experience with businesses, is you can't measure that properly. It's like, hey, you go into this space together and you can't, it's like you, you can't predict what's the outcome hmm. because it's a creative, it's a crazy space. It's something where, where you will build on each other's learnings, experiences on customer feedback, all these kind of things and fancy words we all use, but you can't predict exactly the outcome. And that's the hard thing for very large and small successful businesses because the number one, they try to protect their success which means they need to, 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 to be willing to, to get to the next level from a business perspective is you need to be willing to fail. And that's the hardest thing in today's society because failing is bad or is seen as bad. Vana. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I, I think that was always been the challenge for me going into a space where a client says, okay, we want to explore this. And I say, let's do this. And, uh, you know, like, but I can't guarantee the outcome come, but I've kind of shifted my mind around that a little bit, right? Where I'm saying, well, there is going to be outcome. We're going to learn something. I guarantee you, we're going to learn something. Mm. And the thing is, I think there's a, there's this, and, and that helps us move away from this kind of like, uh, you know, when Asterix drank that magic potion and he gets powerful. That's not innovation, right? That I mean, that that's not the space we will operate in. You're going to have to go into a space where you're willing to learn, and that's what the the organization invests in. If it happens to actually generate something really awesome, wow! You've just turned a a huge profit on a learning uh, experience. And uh, and when I say learning, it's not. It could be learning for your employees, for the people in the team. It's always learning. I learn to this day, but it's also learning for the organization. Like so, um, oh, sorry, you go, uh, sure. so Van, I just want to tell what you the last word you said the learning for the organization, and I think it it brings me back to this this concept of innovation and specifically innovation cycles, and how potentially we think about success in a linear fashion and not in a cyclical manner, and that then fuels the stigma around failure and why. We don't necessarily allow organizations and individuals with inside organizations time to learn from their mistakes and learn from their failures because we're too focused on the linear progression inside of that. And inside of thinking about innovation cycles is get drawn, I get drawn to a, a phrase from 1942, which is from Joseph Schumpeter, where he says, creative destruction. And if you think about what that means, is it's 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 almost like a paradox in those two words because you want it to be creative, but at the same time, you are distracting things. So you're breaking things. And what and how do you think about building a space where you allow people to have and do both of those actions? Yeah, exactly. And this is moving out of this kind of attitude of like, everything needs to be certain. It's, it, uh, you know, I, I, I always remember like, like we've been trained to, like when you stand in front of the client as a consultant, like be certain, be certain. And then at some stage I, I realized like, it's not about being certain about things because you can't be certain about anything. And I, a lot of corporations are like, oh, we want to be certain. It's about being confident because when you go on the innovation space, into the innovation space, or you go in the journey, I'm kind of, not kind of, I'm confident that you're going to get something out of it. I'm just yeah, not certain if you're going to be able to, uh, you know, make a billion dollars, but I'm confident you're going to but this get is, some learning. This is where things go nuts because um, we learned we learned the words, right? Ineffable, the ineffable experience. So you need to go through an innovation process or be in an innovation space in order to really know and understand what it is. I prefer to be in a lot of those spaces because they tend to be different every time. You know, and you learn every time. But this is, I would say, more symbolic for life. You know, uh, if you put yourself beyond your comfort zone, you're going to learn. And if you don't, you're going to be in space, stuck in spaces that are going to be doing the same thing all over, over, over again. And at some point, when you need to change, then you don't want to because you're stuck in that space. And I'm, I'm thinking in that sense, if, if once you make 
make the argument that change is good and people understand it and feel it and want it, then you would have a flood towards innovation spaces, which is also maybe bad because then everybody wants to innovate constantly. And that, that, that takes away from the structures that have built the world. <laughs> but in that sense, it's, it's always a, an, in that and right now, there's a disbalance in the way that people want to innovate or um, uh, they don't want to innovate. And if they do, they want to do it within a certain frame because we only have 20,000 euros. And oh, we, well, yeah, we're a multi-million dollar company, but we have 20,000 euros for innovation for our whole new products for next year. It's like, I don't, I don't, I don't get that math. You know, in that sense, there's there and there's always this number that gets gets to these creative people, which I think in that sense fuels creativity again, because you're limited to something like a budget, and then you get creative. It's like, what can we do with this 20,000 euros? And I would say the people who will say we need to predict and control things, they know this. It's like, yeah, just limit their budget to that and they'll be very, very creative. And you know, and that just didn't didn't be used to be like that because in the beginning when the word innovation didn't even uh, mean anything outside of going to space or whatever uh, nobody knew about that but right now I'd say it's become a tool innovators knowing how to implement innovators in a company has become a tool and that's it sounds a bit sad actually as you think yeah. and it's it it sounds easy if you talk about like it is a tool but it's I can tell you it's one of the diff most difficult things in organizations to bring this magic, like, literally all of what we talked about, bring that to life. Because it's if, if, you, if you just think about it as an organism, you bring something, you, you, you bring a new DNA string, like we talked uh, about in the past, Dennis and Joshua, you bring a new piece of a DNA string into an existing DNA and the whole DNA is transforming. Mm. So you implement something and you don't know what effect that will have. You hope, of course, it's a positive thing, but that also means that the organism of the organization is working against it first because it's something external that that's that came in. Um, and I think that's also something that's the difficult part in organizations because we're all humans and we love to have stability and we love to keep things as they are because we are getting used to that. Not everyone is every day something new. Like, like you said, then it's changing, changing, changing. It's, it's nothing for everyone. So Joshua, I guess, want to say something. And then we, we, we go towards summing things up. Joshua. Yeah, just quickly, something that popped into my head was my mind went back to our discussion around the innovation compass and specifically the, the, the difference between a compass and a map and how you need a, a compass to navigate effectively inside of a map. And I think it's quite fascinating just how and where this space discussion has shifted inside of that and how then you start thinking about what does an innovation toolkit look like and what are the components, you know, we've identified that people are a crucial uh, factor inside of creating an innovation space. And then there's a mindset, then is it, is it physical or is it digital? What are those different elements? What are the types of questions that you need to ask? What are the takeaways that you can can take from an innovation space? And Bernard, you know, what, what you said around an innovation space, I can go in confident that you'll gain something from engaging inside of this innovation space, but I'm not 100% sure what that will be. And I think that, Dennis, that maybe links to your point around saying, you know, these multi-billion and multi-billion euro companies that have a fixed budget for innovation, are they maybe going in with their thinking around innovation as fixed and again linear and saying that by putting this amount of money behind it, I expect this amount of return. But by not engaging inside of that activity, they're actually foregoing the opportunity to create something inside of that innovation space, which may unlock something in a much longer term thinking perspective, which would be extremely beneficial for the company and they lose out on that because they've got this fixed notion of what it means to create an innovation space yeah we we could go two hours more <laughs> but we need to, we, we need to get slowly towards an end so let's do last round on what did we learn what do we think people can take away from today 
And what would be our call to action to people listening to this or watching this? Dennis goes last. Why? Jens goes first. <laughs> <laughs> I can go first if you want. So let's then change I, things up a little bit. Let, let's change things. So I will start. Vanna will be second. Joshua will be third. And Dennis will finish. Normally, I always have the time to think. <laughs> so let's go. So I think it was very interesting perspective of seeing that space is for a lot of people first. And we, we diverged a little bit into that in the beginning, if something physical. But what we have explored now is it's not necessarily something physically. It can be different ways. Um, it, it can be mental as well, which 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 I think there's there's a lot in that. Of course, I'm always kind of navigating towards people and the culture of people and the interaction between people because that's where where I'm in the whole time. But for me, what, what I've wrote down is the transition. And that I think is true, like like I said, the example from Walt Disney, from a physical perspective, how do you help people to transition between spaces? But I think it's equally important in a digital world, how do you help people transform into um, or transition into different spaces? And the, the example with Discord, which is a digital platform in itself is, an, is, is a good one. Um, but I think it's also mentally. How do you transform and transition mentally in, into innovation spaces, into a mindset that helps you to unleash things in different ways? And if you then are able to do this, like you guys said, like a facilitator or an, an, an advisor, trusted advisor, whatever it is, to help people to do that, that's it's like you have the, the black judo belt in, in innovation spaces vanna yeah um how, how can i top that one um i'm gonna keep it short um i i think something we didn't dive into but i think it was a nice lead into the conversation was jens when you spoke about the magic of the company i think there's actually something to explore there even deeper um because you know it can be one of many things but i tend to think if there isn't magic in the company it's that's the first thing that you have to solve um, the other thing that uh, th that I took away from this is uh, I like the idea of creating this space. I think, Dennis, you brought that up. Then encour encouraging people to join the space. And then the other thing that I noted down here is also don't clutter the space. Don't put too much stuff in the space. Because I think sometimes, and we might be blind of it uh, as designers or as facilitators, is that we over-design things. Sometimes you just need to give people space to to share what they need to share. And I, uh, I encourage people people, and this is the thing I want to share is I encourage you to let go of your um, preconceived ideas and then step into this space. And I, I empathize, it's not easy to do, but that's, that's how you successfully step into the innovation space. Josh. Of course, I'll, I'll build, off, build off a few threads that you, you put down, Anna. So I'm going to frame my, my takeaways around three words. So the first is body language. And I think inside of a digital environment, we need to be conscious of our body language and what that means, because you can tell a lot about how a person feels about how they're interacting with one another by the body language that they put down. The second word is imagination. I think in order to, to think in an innovation way, you need to embrace imagination and you need to embrace what that means from a creativity standpoint. And then the third, it's not a word, it's rather a phrase. And it's one that Vanna said today is strip it out. And I think that that's going to tie into my call to action to everyone listening and to those watching is because I think sometimes with everything going on in a highly digital, highly technological centered world, we can overcomplicate things. And I think that if you sometimes take a step back and you create an innovation space that has people at its center and allows people to show up as their real selves, you can start to unlock some extraordinary thinking. Um, and that's quite a quite an exciting thought that uh, that at least in my head. Um, so yeah, thanks guys for the conversation. Extremely valuable as as usual. So Dennis, I'll hand over to you to bring us home. Thank you, uh, Joshua. Uh, it's hard to follow uh, a class act like that again, <laughs> uh, but I will try. I will try. 
uh, am I able to uh, share my screen? Do you think that's wise or should I do it verbally just for? Ye of course. But then we need to have the visual translator, Vanna, supporting <laughs> okay. the audio. Uh, it's, it's, it's okay because I, I'll, I'll use it to, uh, I would say, uh, share a, a small story and then hopefully bring it home in that sense. Um, you can share. Let's see where so for everyone who is listening uh, on the audio, in the audio world, head over to YouTube and check out the, the YouTube version of this. Um, yeah. The channel is called Jens Heitland, if in case you have not thought about that. Please. Subscribe and press the bell button. And, and it is exactly that's thank you for the plug, Werner. Yeah, and it's <laughs> click on the button above now. It's as well episode <laughs> 88. Crazy wow, 88. Congratulations. Crazy 88. So, so we'll, yeah. We, we, talked, we talked about innovation in space. And uh, I love the word space because space means that I can draw usually. Uh, I start drawing a cube and cubes mean to me a physical space that I can uh, map something inside, I can look outside and I can uh, kind of see if something moves in and out of that space. And, uh, and uh, when, when we're talking about innovation, uh, there tend to be that uh, there's a discussion about the fact that there's a world where things are working in a certain way. And there's this magical space where all kinds of things happen and then there's the regular world again and you 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 implement what you've thought about um moving to that i'll take away this image and then i just uh, have a very simple schematic uh, sharing uh, with uh, everybody and i'll, I'll just verbally uh, try to explain this um you have th um, um, uh, um, the regular way of uh, working in um uh, in, a, in a, I would say in a, in a company or organizational structure, I would say tends to be in a two-dimensional way. So people look and um, bring back reality to a two-dimensional plane. That's why we like Excel sheets and flat uh, surfaces uh, because they tend to simplify a very complex way of thinking. Uh, in my experience, uh, going into a innovation space is trying to get people uh, and, and priming them uh, towards um, uh, moving into a three and even four dimensional space. And a three dimensional space is already saying, um, welcome to this new space and kind of look around to the possibilities that you have in all these different other dimensions. And when you are even able to be able to incorporate the, uh, the time factor, um, you're going to even be able to uh, um, think of all, all other things. Uh, and I, this refers back to Joshua's idea that you can uh, step back and look at things in a different way. And I'm thinking innovation space should be able to do that. Uh, but you need to be uh, primed and step into this space, like uh, Werner said, um, and be able to uh, uh, move through this space and have some kind of a rule or a Sherpa that will help you to guide you through this um, um, magical space that suddenly deliver something that is maybe more than just an end product that people want in a company. It's uh, your ability to learn uh, from, from mistakes and everything that's happening in this space. That's maybe the most valuable thing that happens there. But it depends on the way that we look at uh, um, uh, innovation uh, in four dimensional space, because I think it's gonna be a factor and a space that's becoming more increasingly valuable to everybody in the whole world. So. Uh, once you've gone through this space, um, you need to be able to take something with you uh, and, able, and, and that you're able to apply in the regular world. It's like a story that you bring back and that you're able to share to bring other people to that same space that allows them to uh, um, evolve their thinking and be able to look from different perspectives and work with people, collaborate with people uh, in order to uh, make things uh, move to the next level. So that's innovation space to me. Thanks for sharing. Thank you, Dennis. As, as always, ex extremely valuable helping us to understand what we are thinking and, and talking about, bringing that into a visual. And we will share the visuals on social media as well for those who are interested. If not, you should check that out on the YouTube channel. Talking about spaces, uh, we normally don't do this, but I just wanted to open a door to a space uh, to to engage with us. So if you're listening to this or if you're 
watching this on YouTube, there's a door we, which we keep open for you if you want to engage with us as a, as a quartet. Is it quartet? Quattro? Um, if, if, you, if you are interested in doing something with the four of us in, in what way ever, um, joining us for a podcast where we talk about your problem, innovating your company, whatever it is, reach out to any one of us and uh, we're happy to discuss. Um, yeah, that's just a, an open door which we want to create um, without discussing it before. <laughs> that's, I like those. That, that's, that's just the opportunity when you're the host, you can just throw things in. You can open doors. Exactly. Open doors. So there's an open Thanks. door in, in, in case um, anyone is interested in engaging with us. Um, Thanks, guys. was awesome again. Um, it's always fascinating what we come up with, with just having a headline and then just riff on each other. So I think there's something really magic, as, as you guys said, in it. Looking forward to the next one. I've already yeah. a couple of topics we can explore. And thank you for creating the space, Jens. Yes. The door That's is open. Us through. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys, and see you next time. Thanks for listening to today's episode. You will find the links and resources in the show notes of this episode. If you would like to support the podcast, the most impactful thing you can do is subscribing to the show on any of the podcasting platforms and give me a review. This will help me to reach more innovators around the world and bring some of you into the show. If you have any question to the guest or want to engage with me, feel free to reach out to me on my public WhatsApp at plus four nine one five one seven zero three three one one seven six i will repeat plus four nine one five one seven zero three three one one seven six it's all whatsapp texting only or follow me on social media and contact me there and finally if you look for someone educating you or your team on innovation culture coaching have a look at heightlandinnovation.com thanks and see you in the next episode